So the tabernacle and the temple was built in such a way that many, many people could stand in the outer court. But the holy place and the holy holies was very small in comparison. And this is the invitation to each one of us to come in. Inside that holy place, there were no lights, there were no windows. It was lit with God's presence. There was the fragrance of his presence. There was revelation of who he is that would go directly into your heart and transform you. You see, once upon a time, it was only the high priest that was allowed to go in there once a year, and even that terrified everybody. I trust that you're not terrified of his presence. I trust that you're not milling around in the outer court because Jesus opened a way for each one of us to come. And for each one of us, once again, to be reconciled to a God and Father who would change us not through condemnation or judgment, but who already judged his son on your behalf, never to happen again, once and for all time. And that's an amazing thing. But more amazing is that he conferred sonship and daughterhood on each one of us and adopted us and honors us by saying, I'm not ashamed to call you my children. He says, he's not ashamed. Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed to call him father? Invitations to come in. When Jesus had completed and received the full judgment of sin and of death, and of hell upon his body on that cross, he shouted out, it's finished, and the curtain in the temple was torn by God from top to bottom. Don't be part of those who are trying to sew it together again, but be part of those who through the grace and the mercy of God say, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's go into his presence. Let's be those who enjoy his faithfulness, enjoy his mercy, I don't see anybody with wings here this morning, so I, I, I take it we're all on this journey. That's all I hear the Holy Spirit saying is come in, come in. I want you to focus your attention upon the children just for a moment, just for a moment. A lot of the children are sitting in that classroom over there, but, but you know, there's no distance in the spirit, and there's some teenagers that are sitting here with us, and I love that, that the, that the older children are actually sitting under the preaching of the Word and under the presence of God for a long period of time. Joshua loved that Moses would leave, but Joshua would stay. And Father, this morning, we just want to pray for our young people from the cradle, Lord, all the way through to adulthood, Lord, would you place your hand and your presence on them in a unique, special way? Would you transform them in a unique and special way as we together, you said one can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. You said we don't ask, and that's why we don't receive, but this morning we're asking on behalf of our children, Lord, would you presence yourself, transform them? Would you raise up once again the Joshua's who love your presence, who love you? Would you raise up once again the Daniels, Lord? Would you raise up the Gideons, Lord? 
Would you raise them up amongst us, Lord? Would you prosper this family from generation to generation? That from out of the generations that you raise up, Lord, there would be those who would lead us further than what we've ever been before. Would you bless them with anointing of power and of the Holy Spirit, with signs and wonders that will follow them as they trust in you, Lord? Would you powerfully work in our children's lives, I pray. I could stay there. Couldn't you stay there? I don't know. What's it like at the back there? Is it, is it like that at the back as well? Otherwise, I'd invite you to the front just to experience what we're experiencing here in the front. If I didn't make myself breathe now, I think I'd stop breathing and just... So this house has been looking at the whole subject of honor. And I want you to turn in your Bibles or on your apps to Romans chapter 12. I'm sure we've touched this verse. And many of you might be saying, what can we still learn? There's still a lot that we can learn about honor and a culture of honor. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, it says, be kindly affectionate. What's the word be mean? <laughs> You've got to be like this. Be like this. Right? Switch that be on. Okay? Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. In some of the translations, it says, honor one another above yourself. I want to take you to Deuteronomy 6, and just in case you're one of the modern generation, I'll put it on the screen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. I command you in the name of Jesus not to get rid of that responsibility to schools and teachers and other educational institutions. I command you in the name of Jesus that God has given you the authority to educate your children. That was a good place to say amen, just by the way. No, no, it doesn't work now. Boundaries, parameters, loving God, first priority. What are our homes like? God is one, a plurality of one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Yachid, one. He is one. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it said he created you. In this way, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he created you, he created you in his image, spirit, soul, and body, a triune being like him, but totally different. So he is. And God has called us to walk in honor the way he walks in honor. 
Because one of the things that has been said is that the atmosphere of heaven is made up of honor. In the Godhead, there is absolute honor between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because it causes absolute unity, togetherness, purposefulness, one directionness. It, 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 it brings it all together as one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit walk in absolute honor of one another. When God created, He created through the Word by the power. He created, Colossians says, through Jesus all things were created. The Father created all things through Jesus and by the operation of the Holy Spirit. And there wasn't a little voice that said, hmm, I think I could have done it better. There wasn't. It was boom! And the God had said, wow! You know that silly joke, okay? Some of you are waiting for it. And it was good. Honor. And this is the topic of what I want to share today, developing a culture of honor in a cancel culture. Only the teenagers will understand what I'm speaking about right now. And some of the parents who've taken the time to listen to how they speak. I tried to learn a couple of lessons from my granddaughters. So here are the definitions that Derry spoke to us about as far as honor is concerned. It's the ability to accurately acknowledge who people are in order to give them what they deserve and to receive the gift of who they are in our lives. Honor comes out in this way. It is to be able to respect everyone. Peter said, you know, honor the king, honor everyone. And honor and respect, the only difference between honor and respect is that respect is earned, honor is given. Respect is earned. Don't tell me that I will honor that person the moment they honor me. That's not how it works. You see, honor attracts honor. But we don't honor because we want to be honored. We honor because God is honor. Because in his relationship, he honors in his triunity as well as he honors you, whether you deserve it or not. And he says, we are to honor in the same way. Respect is earned, honor is given, right? And honor is valuing something exceptionally highly. And it's one of those things in this cancel culture that we're living in nowadays, you know? By cancel, I mean, in the olden days, they would say, off with his head. Henry Higgins. And we have to relearn the value of people. We have to relearn the value of relationships. We have to relearn how to value every single person because in them is something that God wants to develop. It's to esteem people. It's to put a weight upon, for instance, where, where people are giving out wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Some of those things are so that we will spend a lot of money just to get it. We put a weight onto it, and we need to be putting a weight onto our relationship with one another. We need to be seeing people as precious and valuable. The ability to accurately acknowledge who they are. How God designed them. How God wired them. 
what the potential is there, even if it's not manifest yet. The other definition was the ability to celebrate who a person is without stumbling over who they are not. I've just put in brackets who people perceive them to be, but not. Because we put labels. Mm -hmm. We dealt with labels. But a lot of those labels come from the way we view people. I have a problem when people prophesy things and then expect it not to happen. You know the R27 here? I got so furious with my neighbors the other day, there was a truck that had sort of tipped off the road a little bit into the soft sand, and then they came out, oh yeah, the road of death, the road of death, the road of death. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The more they speak it, the more the demonic realm has the ability to create situations where people get killed. But it was just a truck that was stuck next to the road. And in the same way, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And the reality of the thing is that we stare ourselves blind at the issues and the things that we perceive of people when we meet them and then begin to speak into being what we have perceived, how we have experienced it, and then we start calling them names. This is what Desmond preached about a little while back, you know, that we all look like a toxic waste dump when we meet each other. Come on. I especially dressed up this morning. Just hoping you didn't see a toxic waste dump, okay? But inside each of us there's gold. Inside each of us there's something that God has placed. Inside each of us, when it is knit together, it will transform this world. If we are able to get it out and to knit it together with whatever the gold is in one another, and if our focus is on calling each other what the gold declares. But we get people who feel, you know, the sheriff has died and they, they're the new sheriff in town. And so it, they feel it's their responsibility to point out certain things to people. Have you met anybody? Like, oh, no. Nobody like that here. Yeah, that's a very peculiar thing, isn't it? You know, you should stop doing that. You know, you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. Yeah, some of you are laughing because you've heard those words. But let me tell you the truth. The truth of the matter is that God deals with us. Can you just rest in the faithfulness of God? Such a good preach this morning as we worship. And God calls us to bring this out of one another. Stop trying to act God's part. Stop trying to be the judge of the whole universe. Stop trying to be and become what Paul says to the Romans, honor one another above yourself. That's why we can sit in huts with the Vambu people, with mosquitoes buzzing around us, trying to eat India, um, India rubber, uh, I mean chicken. That's why we can go anywhere in the world, because we esteem people, because we lift them up, and because we know God is going to do some changing, radical changing, and bring about. That's why there's a Shama ministry in Vambu land today. That's why there's a Logos in Kirtman's work today. That's why churches are being planted all over the place because they're people who are prepared to go knit together with other imperfect people and find God's will for their lives. So we encourage you to develop a spirit of honor, a culture of honor, 
It is something that the Bible commands us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Culture of honor. That's where it starts. Because as I love him, all of a sudden I find he has a love for me that far outweighs what I can actually love him with. As I begin a history and a journey with God, I'm able to be changed by that love from within. The toxic way it starts being changed. It's like a chemical. It dissolves it and gets rid of it. Love the Lord your God. A culture, spirit of honor. In families, honor your mother and father that you may live long upon this earth. Honor them. And mothers and fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Mothers and fathers, honor your children. Be careful how you speak about them. Be careful what report you accept about them. Maybe it's time that as parents we have a prophetic revelation of what, is, what our father is preparing our children for and to begin to speak that. Anna and I spoke about sneaking blessings on our kids. They didn't have a, a, a chance. When they were fast asleep at night, Anna and I would sneak into their bedrooms and speak words of blessing over them. <laughs> And sometimes at work, they wake up in a good, in a good mood. <laughs> a spirit, a culture of honor that flows from the children to the parents, from the parents to the children, from there into the community. Husbands, honor your wife. Love them as Christ loved the church. It's a spirit of honor. Christ loved us so much that he gave his life. We are to love our wives. We are to honor our wives, men. If you're not sure, now some of you don't have wives, so, but husbands, I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to your spirit. And it's no good honoring another woman if you're not honoring your wife. Oh, if my wife was just like that one, yeah, she would be if you spoke honor over her. She would be better than that one. You did make a promise when you got married, right? And you know the Bible says don't compare. Get on with the job of making your wife into the queen that she ought to be through what you honor her with. Hey, my lovey. Am I doing good? Okay. <laughs> Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Jeez, he was so nice when we were dating, but now. Echanakseni. <laughs> Come on, people, in your homes, in your marriage relationship, begin to polish up that honor. Begin to be aware of what you're saying. And that saying comes from an attitude in your heart that needs to change. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is good. Right? Employers, deal impartially without threatening your workers. Deal impartially with them. Don't have favorites. And then employees, be obedient to your masters from the heart. Give them the honor due to them. Stop stealing their stuff. Stop stealing their time. Get there on time. Do your job and do it from the heart to honor God in the work that he has called you to do. Amen? Netsua? Okay, a spirit, a culture of honor is built on those things. Is that okay? So what is the spirit of dishonor? 
Oh, wow. Okay, we'll go through this quickly. Criticizing. Condemning. Complaining. I want to get back to this whole parent thing. You know that God gave you the children that he gave you because he has equipped you to be good parents to those children. We sit with the Christian school here too. I'm, I'm convincing the teachers to understand that all 17 pupils they've got in their class were specially chosen by God for them because he equipped them to look after those 17. West Coast Family Church, the children that we've got in this family, God has given to this family. Don't you write them off. Don't you call them funny names. Don't complain. Couldn't God give us better children? Couldn't God give us, you know, on fire teenagers? They can only get there if you have a culture of honor. Judging, attacking, denouncing, fault-finding, being opinionated and harsh, spirit of dishonor. But it doesn't describe the whole thing, not by far, okay? If you find any of those things, repent and return. Times of refreshing will come from the presence of God. Acts 3, verse 18, 19, 20. Repent, return, for the times of refreshing would come in your lives. You want to live in a refreshed way? You got to li listen to Uncle Mike now. Spirit of dishonor. What about sarcasm? I was good at that. I think I got a master's degree in that at one stage of my life. And then they had to tell me that sarcasm was the lowest form of wit. It's dishonoring. It's saying you're stupid. It's saying you're ugly. It's saying all manner of things. Sarcasm or mocking or ridiculing. Look at that person. Look how they've dressed. Scorning them, sneering, being offended. You know, in the cancel culture that we're living in, you don't have to go very far, you know, to be offended, right? Just have to go on to Facebook. I mean, just go and check it out. Go and tweet, Twitter, whatever. Spirit of dishonor. Cancel culture. Works together with a spirit of entitlement. So I I've, I've found out, you know, that some people that when they are on social media and they are writing something, they want an immediate response. If they don't get an immediate response from you, they get offended and then they ghost you. Some of you got teenagers, eh? Yeah, no, no, find out what that word means. It means they ignore you. They ignore you. They cancel you out. You know, when they see each other at school, you know, they can see that attitude. <laughs> or at youth, eh? Not at youth. Not at this youth. No. I want to speak a little bit in the few seconds I've got left on the consequences of dishonoring. Now that you've seen what dishonoring is, now that you've got the definition of honoring, you know, what's the consequences? What happens to me if I walk in dishonor? And it's interesting to see in Jesus' life in Mark 5 and 6. In Mark chapter 5, he's doing the most amazing miracles. There's a woman of you know, that has an issue of blood for 12 years, and she's gone to every single doctor 
psychologists, psychiatrists, she's been to them all, she's spent all her money, and she's worse. And she says in her heart, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And she touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed immediately. And the next thing that happens, he gets called to where a little girl has died, Tabitha. And he has to go through all sorts of people and all sorts of mocking and scorning. But he gets into the room and he just tells her to wake up. And she wakes up. And he raises Tabitha from the dead. You know, Mark chapter 5 is like one of those amazing. Immediately. And then Mark chapter 6, he goes to his own town. And in that town, they scorn him. But isn't this the... Son of Joseph, he, we used to play as children, man. We know him. Doesn't he have brothers and sisters? Who does he think he is? And in verse 5 of chapter 6, it says he could do no mighty miracles in his hometown because of dishonor. So with the dishonoring, what he was able to do for them was cut off immediately. It's like stage six. People overseas won't understand that joke. Okay. But South Africa here, we understand that. Fuck. No more light. Did you hear that? Jesus wanted to. It didn't say he wouldn't. It said he couldn't. He must probably laid hands on some people and their headaches were healed. But as far as mighty miracles were concerned, he couldn't do it because of their dishonor. Consequence of dishonoring is you cut off what God has intended for you through those people. Cain, in Genesis 4, he gets extremely angry. He is spitting nails, but they didn't have nails in those days. So he's spitting thorns. He's so angry because God accepted his brother's sacrifice, wasn't accepted, and the consequence of that was murder. We want to walk in that? Ham, Noah's son. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah after his little cruise, he plants himself a vineyard and he gets drunk. And he's lying naked in his tent when Ham comes in. And Ham runs to go and to the brothers. Dishonored his father. Shem and Japheth walked backwards with most probably a blanket or a cloth, covered their father's nakedness, honored him. Ham dishonored him. The consequence of that wasn't curse upon Ham, but it's a curse on his generation because Canaan that was born out of him had to bear the consequence of that action. Would we like to see our children? Bearing the consequence of our dishonor? Say no. I'd let you say no. Aaron and Miriam, they were so upset in Numbers 12. They dishonored Moses. He was leading the nation of Israel, but then he married an Ethiopian woman. <laughs> Skanda. And they said in the heart, but we can do all of this. Who does he think he is? And look what he's done now, going to marry this woman from Ethiopia. And the Bible says God heard them. And he said to Moses, tell them to come and meet me outside the door of the tent tomorrow morning. I'll come out from the Holy of Holies. I'll meet them there at the tent door. This is that serious. And when they were there, boom, judgment on Miriam. She 
was as white as snow, contracted leprosy as a judgment of what she had done. And Moses intercedes, says, please, Lord, please, Lord, don't, don't do this, Lord, don't do this. And God said, if her father had spat in her face, she would be unclean for seven days. She will be outside the camp for seven days as a leper. After that, it will be, be gone. Just like if a father had spat in her face. Dishonor. God got so angry because of dishonor, the consequence was judgment. Saul and David. Saul dishonored David right from the start. David in the most difficult circumstances never stopped honoring Saul. The consequence of that is that Saul's, in fact, Jonathan's offspring was honored by David long after Saul and David was dead. But Saul, because of his dishonoring, got a, an evil spirit tormented him. Because he dishonored, the door was open for an evil spirit to torment him. And the only way that that could be calmed down is if David came and played on the harp for him. Michael, David's wife, Mike, Michael is watching as David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, and he is so passionate that he is dancing and twirling and whooping and gets rid of his, most of his clothes. He's most probably only in his jockeys. And she is says to him, what a fool you made of yourself in front of all the people today. Dishonored, David dishonored the presence of God and she was barren for the rest of her life. Consequence of dishonoring. Jesus and Barabbas, as he finally stands with the judgment upon him, Pilate remembers that at this time of the year there is a thing that they did and the people could choose do you want this murderer called Barabbas? Barabbas means son of the father, Bar Abbas. Do you want this murderer or do you want Jesus to be set free? And they all together with us, we all shouted Barabbas, crucify Jesus. The consequence was that the one who was bringing life, healing, and wholeness to them was crucified in the hope that they would be rid of them. But God loved us so much that he paid the price and raised Jesus from the dead that those who would believe would be forgiven and reconciled. Despite the fact that we rejected him, it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. So in conclusion this morning, how do I develop my ability to honor? Wow, it's, you know, there's a culture out there that's pressurizing me, pressurizing me, pressurizing me. Um, I find it more and more difficult when I see what people in authority are doing, you know, to walk in honor because it. You know, it just makes me so angry that I want to, I want to curse them and all the rest of it. But how? How many of you ask the same question? No. You all know how to do this. Jesus gives us the answer in Matthew chapter 5, and you need to go and read this. He sits with his disciples and, and he's, going to, he's going to end with when pers people persecute you and falsely accuse you and violently react towards you, this is how you deal with it. This is how we win our battles. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed 
to be envied, peaceful, powerful, able to cope. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor in spirit doesn't mean, you know, that they don't have money or they don't have clothes or they don't have food. It means a recognition in the positive, a recognition of our absolute need of God. God will look to this one who is poor of spirit and who trembles at his word, Isaiah says. Blessed are those who mourn. There are things in my life that I say, Lord, please change those things. I recognize that there's stuff that doesn't accurately display who you are. And I ask God, won't you please change those things? I mourn. I mourn over those things. Blessed are the merciful, those who are able to not only receive mercy, but, but give mercy. The word mercy means absolute power under complete control. So that when you are riled and when you are mocked and when you are scorned, that you're able to stand and able to give mercy. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God wants to do that in your life. God wants to do that so that you'd be able to walk in honor, so that you'd be more and more like him. God wants to do it in your families. God wants to do it in our workplaces, God wants to do it in this church and in every other church. And it starts when we recognize our need of him. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, Let's get off our purchase where we think we have the solutions for everyone. Where we think we have answers for every question. Let's come back to that place where we say, Lord, be merciful to me. Allow me to hear your voice clearly. Allow me to hear what your wisdom is in every single situation that I face. Allow me to be blessed. And it doesn't depend on how much I have, what I've got, where I've been, but allow me just to be with you. Closer and closer and closer and walk out the rest of my life displaying who you are to the people around about me wherever I am. I ask in Jesus' name.